Hi and welcome to the Open Tech Lab. So it's Christmas Day here today and I've got various relatives upstairs and uh, I'm just processing a rather large Christmas dinner. But I thought I'd uh, show you a little present I've received. This is the uh, Pocket Chip Kit, which is the mobile kit for the Chip Mini Computer. Now, the Chip Mini Computer is uh, a Kickstarter that's been running for a while. It managed to raise over $2 million uh, from all kinds of backers. I think they got about 40000 in total. And uh, with such a large crowd, a lot of people are interested in this device. And uh, the heart of this is the Chip Mini Computer, which is supposed to be the world's cheapest computer. And uh, in many ways, it's a lot like the uh, Raspberry Pi. It runs Linux, it's ARM-based, and uh, it's also designed for educational applications or for people wanting to experiment with electronics or to experiment with Linux. Uh, so the, one of the differences is the price, but also they've taken it in, the dire in a slightly different direction. They've tried to make it more suitable for mobile uses and things like that. So I'm really interested to see what we can do with this device in the Open Tech Lab. I, they do have a really interesting platform for uh, people, uh, young people who are interested in learning about uh, uh, game development and software development. They provide a super simple uh, software development environment. But I'm more interested in this device as a platform for running embedded Linux. So perhaps I can do some interesting projects with a, with a handheld device that I can attach various modules to. So in this video, we're going to have a look at what's in the box and uh, we're going to have uh, a, little exp a little play around with the device and see what it can do. And we'll see if we can do some experiments and see what's what. So let's take a closer look at what I've actually received here. So I've got two packages. I've got the pocket chip kit here on the left and I've also got the HDMI kit uh, for the chip mini computer. And having these two uh, kits allows me to use the chip mini computer in two ways. It can either be plugged into the pocket chip uh, for mobile usages, or it can be plugged into the HDMI dip base, which can be used when I want to use it for uh, some, you know, desktop usage, attaching it to a monitor and such like. And uh, on the front here, it says it's useful for games, music, Linux terminal, and much more with smiley face. And on the back, it shows you a little bit of information about how to charge it. Uh, the whole thing shrink wrapped. So uh, yeah, let's have a look inside. So now we've got this thing unwrapped, we can have a closer look at it. And as you can see, it's shaped a bit like a Blackberry, except it's a bit bigger. And it consists of a single PCB along here with a shell over the back. And uh, on the front, we have a, a display with a resistive touchscreen over the top. So of course, that those uh, resistive screens are better controlled with a stylus. And then underneath, we have a little uh, clicky keyboard uh, made of dome keys. Uh, tactile dome keys here and uh, we have some breakout ports which I'll have a look at in more detail in a moment and we have a little lanyard hole and then on the reverse of the uh, device you can see we've got a, a big old battery uh, stashed in the back here and of course the uh, heart of the whole thing is the chip mini computer and uh, let's see about removing that so we can have a look at that in a bit more detail and to remove it we certainly have to use a bit of force uh, but it eventually comes away. So here we have it, the chip $9 computer. And uh, to give you a bit more of a closer look at the thing, I will remove this screw here so we can remove the back shell off it. So now we've got the back shell of the device off, we can have a closer look at what's inside. And uh, well, without wanting to sound too much like your grandfather, I must say I am absolutely stunned by what they can put on this device and still sell it for $9. I mean, this device is many times more powerful than my first computer, which I had about uh, 22, 23 years ago. Uh, so much more powerful. It would have been a supercomputer in those days. And yet this thing is now sold for $9. It absolutely blows my mind. Anyway, the uh, heart of this computer is, of course, this all-winner 
R8 microprocessor system on chip in the middle here. And if, uh, attached to it, we have uh, this uh, RAM here. And uh, that's about all we have on this side. And then if we flip the thing over, we've uh, got in the middle here uh, a big flash chip. This is the hard disk of this computer. It stores all the software and all the files and so on. Uh, we have a power management IC here. And this is basically a, a big multi-channel regulator that produces the various voltages uh, that are needed to supply the whole board. And then this module here is a uh, Wi-Fi chipset, a Wi-Fi module. And uh, then over here, we just have the few connectors that this board has. We have a, a slave USB and we have a host USB and then a headphone port. And then any other connectors that uh, you want to add are produced by uh, plugging things into these uh, these 0.1 inch headers on the sides here. Uh, oh, yeah. And we've got a battery connector here. So on the subject of those 0.1 inch headers, let's have a look at these plug-in modules. So this is the HDMI dip that goes with the chip. Get it? Chips and dips. So uh, to open it up, I'm going to just peel off this little seal here. So what have we got here? Well, we've got a 27 megahertz crystal oscillator over here. Uh, there's a little 1024-bit uh, one-wire EEPROM just here and a power switch and uh, they seem to have broken out the various uh, spare pins uh, into this prototyping area you can see here and then uh, there's uh, obviously the brains of this uh, thing is some kind of HDMI chipset um, can't read what it is just yet because it's got this little holographic sticker on it and I don't know if it comes out on the camera but it's got a sort of um, well, it's got a doge saying such pass so I think these guys have a sense of humor in the way they built this thing <laughs> So let's peel off the label and see what we find underneath. Please don't leave residue. Oh dear. Okay, this looks like a job for the toothbrush. And we've got ourselves a Crontel CH7035B, which is an HDMI encoder chip. So now we can mate these two together. And at first I was a little bit worried that it would be possible to put them together back to front. Uh, but it turns out that this connector here, if you try and put it on the wrong way, uh, then it just doesn't fit because the, uh, the HDMI connector and the USB connector, they bash into each other. So there's no problem there. The only way it fits together is like this. So we'll come back to the pocket chip in just a moment. But to begin with, I'd like to test out the chip. And uh, in this mode, uh, when the unit's plugged into the HDMI dip, it's designed to be used uh, with a keyboard and a mouse and to be plugged into a screen. And in this mode, of course, it functions a lot like a desktop computer, a very small, very low-cost desktop computer. Now, within the pocket chip, the chip within it is pre-flashed with the firmware to power the pocket chip. And so we need to reflash it so that we can program it with the desktop mode of operation. So let's have a look at how to do that now. So the standard method to reflash this thing is via this web application for Google Chrome. And uh, to me, this seems a little bit odd. I would expect to be able to reprogram it using some uh, local application that I can run on my own machine. But, you know, I can't, I can understand that they're trying to make this device as easy to use for newcomers. So I can't fault them for that. So let's try it out and see how it works. So if we navigate in Google Chrome to flash.getchip.com, and uh, on Linux, we have to go through a little bit of uh, Linux-specific setup, which I've, I've already completed. So uh, now we're ready to actually uh, test the um, flasher out and see how it works. So the first thing is it shows us uh, that we need to uh, short out two pins on the 0.1-inch header. So uh, on this side, we have to short together uh, ground and fell f-e-l which is the fourth from the end on the inside row and then next instruction is connect usb let's plug that in device comes to life and immediately the flasher picks it up and detects it and it takes a few minutes of uh, analyzing the device a few minutes a few seconds there we are, and it's picked up the serial number and the NAND flash type. 
And now if we scroll down, we've got a list of different uh, pre-made firmware images that we can install on it. So there's the uh, image for the pocket chip. This was the image that it would have been shipped with. Uh, there's a terminal only build of the chip software. And uh, this is useful, I suppose, if you don't care about having a GUI. And then there are two graphical builds here. There's a normal build and a high power build. And I sus I'm not sure exactly what the difference is, but I suspect it uh, uses more hardware acceleration or something like that. And the difference is that this uh, build claims that you can run it off a PC power supply just by plugging it into your PC USB. Whereas this thing claims that it needs a phone charger to power it. So it needs a little bit more power. So to begin with, I'll just try this high power graphical image and uh, we'll flash that in there. So I'll select this one and then this window pops up here and then we hit go. And now this will take about four or five minutes and we just have to wait patiently until it finishes doing its thing. So I've connected the HDMI dip back into the chip and I've attached a mouse and a keyboard with a USB hub and I've also attached that HDMI capture device I showed you in the previous video and now you see the reason why I had that device in the first place. Now uh, one of my slight gripes with the chip is that it's only got one USB host port which isn't very useful if you want to connect both a mouse and a keyboard. And uh, it's one of a few hidden costs I've noticed when you compare the chip to the Raspberry Pi because uh, to get similar functionality you'll need both a USB hub and uh, the HDMI dip. So just bear that in mind. So here is a capture of the device booting and uh, I've edited the footage down for the sake of brevity. The total boot time, including the time taken to load or everything on the desktop, including the wallpaper, I measured that time as 1 minute 40, which uh, isn't particularly fast, but isn't really a surprise on a low resources device like this one. So now the chip has booted, you can see that we've arrived in a desktop environment. And this desktop environment is XFCE. And if you're new to Linux, you might not know that XFCE is one of the major desktop environments that's available. Uh, and you can install it on your laptop or your workstation. And uh, this is uh, one of the lighter weight desktop environments. So it's very suitable for a device like this. And it's one of the things I love about the Linux software ecosystem, that you can have a full on desktop environment that can run on any kind of device from something as tiny as this, all the way up to some massive multi-core workstation. So the first thing we're going to want to do now is connect to Wi-Fi. So let's go ahead and do that. Great, and now we're connected. So once we're connected to Wi-Fi, if we leave the device for a while, eventually the package manager will kick in and uh, find various updates that need to be installed. And of course, the image that we just installed is probably several weeks or even months out of date. So there will have been uh, all kinds of fixes and security updates in that time. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and install all the updates. And it will list them. And it's downloading them. Okay, so this is going to take a little while, so uh, I'll come back in a minute once everything's updated. So I've sped up the footage of the unit updating itself here. The total update time was about 16 minutes on my unit, which is pretty slow. And it kind of goes to demonstrate one of the things I've noticed about this thing, is, which is that the disk I.O. is pretty slow going, both for reading and writing and uh, you just need to be aware of that. It makes applications starting up quite sluggish. So let's have a look at the software that's bundled in this firmware image. So to begin with, I'm gonna go into the computer things menu and uh, let's have a look at what we've got. So we've got the terminal emulator and uh, this terminal emulator is XFCE terminal. We've got a file manager, which is Thunar. We've got a web browser. This browser is Firefox. Then when we come to the accessories category, this selection is mostly the standard for XFCE. Uh, specifically, it's worth having a look at Leafpad here, uh, which is a simple text editor. Then we come to the games list. This is Alex the Alligator 4. Looks like an old Game Boy game. 
And another Game Boy looking game we have here is called Spout. Finally, we have Pico 8, which is the chip computer's uh, introduction to programming environment. And it has a few games that are supplied by default and it encourages children to look at the code and make their own games and exchange them with their friends. And uh, well, this was kind of the way I got into programming many years ago using QBasic. So I think this is a really great way to get kids into writing code. And uh, well, hopefully it catches on and becomes very successful. Next up in the graphics category, we've got Pico 8 and Vunior. Vunior is a uh, image viewing application. Uh, then we've got a uh, video player, M player, and something to control the audio levels. Next, we've got the office application category. And you can see here we've got listed applications from the GNOME lightweight office suite. Now, I tried starting Abbey Word and I couldn't get it to start up properly. But basically, if it were to work properly, I'd, maybe there's updates. Uh, but uh, it's basically a simple word processing application. Then Gnumeric is a little spreadsheet application. So we can go in here and do all our Open Tech Lab accounts. And I think I've earned about 30 cents so far for running this channel. In the settings category, we haven't got much of note here, just applets from the control panel. And then in the system menu, uh, the main application you should care about is this packages application. So uh, although we don't have many applications installed in the base image, uh, it turns out that in Linux, there is an absolutely huge library of free software uh, applications ready for you to install. And I always say this when introducing people to Linux, but as a Windows user, it's tempting to think that the way to install software is to go to somebody's website and uh, download an installer of some kind. But in uh, typical Linux desktops, the... Um, uh, software is always downloaded via a, a package manager, which is a bit like an app store. And uh, we can search for applications and install anything we want to. And there are thousands of applications for all kinds of uses uh, that are available for you to install. However, not all of them will work particularly well on such modest machines. So be aware of that. But many of them will enable you to do all kinds of interesting things. So just as a little test, I've installed PulseView here. And the version that's in the package manager is a little bit out of date. So packages, you need to get these packages updated. But uh, if we really wanted the newest version, we could build it from source, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, it works quite nicely on this device. And uh, perhaps we could use this as a very small portable logic analyzer. So now I want to come back to the pocket chip. And so I've reflashed the device with the pocket chip firmware and I've inserted it into the pocket chip uh, base here and so next thing is we can power it on so I'll push the power button here I have to hold it down for a second or two and there we go it's booting up it takes a couple of minutes to boot so I'll come back once it's booted okay so the units all booted up and on the first boot we get presented with this uh, welcome screen here it's a little graphical guide to how to use the unit and uh, we can page through it and there's a bunch of information about how to use the uh, system and uh, the main thing I want to do is disable it by pressing zero and then when we uh, enter into the main menu here you can see we're presented with six icons six apps and uh, then there's a power uh, menu here and the settings menu and in the settings menu I can control the brightness and the volume and I can also connect to Wi-Fi so I'll go ahead and do that okay and we're connected so I want to say that I'm finding this device rather uncomfortable to use and there's a couple of reasons why the first is that these dome keys require a great deal of force to press them down so even just typing in my Wi-Fi password has made my thumb tips feel rather mashed up and uh, the other problem I'm finding is that the uh, corners that you hold the device by in your hand are really sh are really quite pointy so I'm finding that it's chafing into my palms quite a lot, which makes it very uncomfortable to hold. And uh, on top of that, uh, if I want to reach out to the screen with my left hand, I need to support the device uh, with my little finger in the middle here. And uh, this is really painful because uh, along the bottom, uh, rather than having any kind of plastic covering, all we have here is the exposed PCB edge. So I'm having fiberglass being ground into my poor little finger. So it's really not very comfortable to hold at all. 
but to me that doesn't matter very much because I don't intend to spend ages uh, uh, holding this thing or programming it. But I am a little bit concerned uh, for the educational audience, this thing. If kids are going to spend a long time learning to program with this device, that doesn't seem very good to me. I'd be worried that uh, they'd end up experiencing quite a lot of pain in their hands. So I don't know if that's an aspect that could be improved in a later revision of the product. So let's have a look at the apps we have pre-installed on the device. So on the top left, we've got the terminal. Uh, now this is Valor Terminal. Uh, in the middle, we've got Play Pico 8, which is that graphical programming environment uh, that we saw from the uh, main chip environment. Then uh, we've got Make Music. And uh, there's a little introductory tour the first time you open it up but basically you program it uh, it's a bit like a, a MIDI sequencer so you can make little tunes with it little chip tunes things like that uh, when we enter into it and then uh, on the bottom left we've got get help now this uh, pops up a little browser that uh, just has a bit of information it's basically the uh, manual for the pocket chip right here then in the middle we've got write which is just a a simple text editor and that text editor is leafpad then on the bottom right we've got browse files which brings up a file browser and that file browser is PC Man FM. so another little gripe that I have with this device is the alignment of the touch screen with the underlying display and uh, one of the problems I'm having is that if I try and touch items on this menu with this uh, with the back end of this pen here the uh, cursor's showing a few pixels below where I'm actually pointing. So to actually get to the menu, I kind of have to jam my pen right up near the top frame, uh, near the bezel, uh, for it to be able to put the mouse cursor where I want it. So that's a bit annoying. Now there is one feature of the device that I like very much, and that's their design for a support stand. And they've just put a couple of little holes in the bottom, and then the idea is that you can just prop the thing up with a pencil or a pen or a rod of any kind. And if we have a lot of text to write, we can improve the usability quite easily by just attaching the USB hub and the keyboard and the mouse. So it turns out that this thing is powered by a port of Debian and by the X server, Xorg. So with that, we can do all kinds of old school X server things. For example, we can run Xeyes. And uh, this is a super useful application which produces a pair of googly eyes that follow your mouse cursor around the desktop. And now we've got Mesa Utils installed, we can run GLX gears and check out the 3D performance. That's not going particularly fast. I wonder if 3D acceleration is enabled. To check that, I'll run GLX info and pipe into less. And by the looks of things at the moment, uh, GLX info is saying it's using a software rasterizer. So I wonder if there's a way of getting the 3D acceleration going on this thing, because it should be supported by the Mali driver. So I don't have too much of a problem with this window manager. It seems to make good use of the screen space. I think my main gripe with it is that uh, because this is Debian, we have access to a huge library of software that we can install. But uh, if we do that, the icons for those applications don't pop up. I haven't figured out a way to uh, expand uh, beyond the six icons that are shown on the screen, uh, which seems rather limiting. And uh, it would be pretty easy for them to implement uh, this functionality if they wanted to. All the other window managers use the free desktop specification, uh, which just defines how applications should put their icons up on the screen. So it seems to me that the device is a little bit improved by installing a better window manager. And I like the Matchbox window manager on this thing. So let's have a quick look at how to install that. So at the moment, when we start the device, we don't have any choice about which window manager the X server will boot into when it starts up. And that's because the LightDM login manager has auto login set. It just automatically logs in as the chip user. So the first thing we need to do is disable that function. And to do that, I'm going to edit this, uh, this configuration file here. Uh, slash lightdm.conf. And then we just have to scroll down and uh, somewhere in here, we just do a search. There's a key called auto login user. There we go. And at the moment it's set to auto login chip. So I commented these two lines out. Now if we exit and save, 
So now the automatic login's disabled, now we can go ahead and install Matchbox. Let's do sudo apt install Matchbox. Okay, so we've got another megabyte of software to install. This will take a few minutes to complete, so I'll come back when all the software is installed. Okay, so now the Matchbox window manager is installed, we just need to reboot the device. Okay, so now instead of being dumped onto the desktop, we arrived at a login page. And the username by default is chip and the password is chip. But now on the top right here, we've got a bit of a choice about which uh, window manager session we start up into. So Pocket WM was the session that we were using previously, but there are already, already a couple of other window managers installed, including Awesome and XFCE, and Matchbox, which was the one I just installed. So let's go ahead and start up inside Matchbox. So Matchbox was a window manager originally designed for the Nokia N900, I believe, which was one of the very early smartphones before Android became popular. And uh, it's designed to be a full screen window manager. So any window you open inside of it is always full screen. And so uh, the first thing we start off with here is a whole uh, list of apps. Now, already I find this a lot more functional than uh, what you get offered by default, uh, where you only get those six buttons, whereas with this we get a whole selection of uh, different software that's ready for us to use. So as you can see, the Matchbox window manager isn't perfect either. It adds a big fat grey border around everything, and also this menu bar along the top is always being displayed as well as this taskbar along the bottom. So the screen is already really tiny, really low number of pixels. And uh, with all these borders that this thing adds, we have even less to play with. So I'd really like to find a window manager that combines the best of both. But for now, because uh, Matchbox uh, window manager just makes it so uh, much easier to see the applications that are installed and get between them, I think I'm going to stick with it for now. Uh, but I'd love to see if there's an improvement of any kind, something that would work better on this tiny screen. So as I say, the screen resolution is very, very low. The resolution is 480 by 272 pixels, really low resolution. And for me, this is one of the most limiting features of the device. It's a real shame that the resolution has to be this low. But then I suppose they are trying to keep the cost to the absolute bare minimum to make this as accessible as possible. And the sort of things that I want to do with it aren't necessarily the sorts of things that they had in mind when they built this thing. So, you know, I can't complain. But I did find an interesting little blog post here which uh, explains how to upgrade the screen uh, to an 800 by 480 touchscreen, which is available from Adafruit for $39.95. So, you know, if I wanted to enhance the device, I'd be quite tempted to see about installing one of those. So the main reason I'm interested in this device is because of the opportunities for electronics making that it offers. It's going to be really easy to attach all kinds of different peripherals, anything I could make up myself, and uh, have it attached to a powerful little Linux machine which I can carry around with me. And I think that's going to come in really useful for some really cool mini projects. But just to try this out, um, it so happens that I have a little GPS module that I ordered from AliExpress some time ago. And this module is really cheap. It was on sale for $3.34 when I bought mine. And uh, when it arrived, uh, as you can see, it looks a little bit grubby, the uh, module in the middle. It's a U-Blocks module. And uh, these U-Blocks modules are very common. You find them in a lot of devices. And uh, the dirtiness of it suggests to me that it's been recycled from something else. And uh, I'm not particularly bothered by the, d the dirtiness of the module. In fact, I rather like it. I like the idea that in China they're uh, recovering old uh, GPS modules and uh, sending them off uh, to other people who make use of them. So this board is pretty simple to use. It's got a standard UART-based interface. So when you power it up, it just starts spitting out NMEA data, which for anyone who hasn't seen that before, I'll show it in action in a second. And it also has a built-in level translator. So the voltage of the serial signal is matched to the voltage of the power supply.
So let's have a closer look at the breakouts along the top of the pocket chip. And uh, first of all, we've got a few power pins, uh, 3 volts and 5 volts, uh, battery input. Uh, we've got uh, ADC, analog to digital converter. We've got six GPIOs. Uh, we've got SPI here with a single slave select. Uh, we've got I squared C and we've got a UART port here. And uh, also, last of all, we've got the uh, FEL FEL line. And uh, by shorting that to ground, it puts the device into the reprogramming state. Now, one of the things I like about this header is the way they've laid out the pads. And you might be able to see that every other pad uh, in this row here is offset by a small amount. And the reason they've done that is that it's a quick and easy way of making um, press fit contacts. So the idea is that uh, when you take a, a 0.1 inch header like this, rather than necessarily having to solder every uh, connection in place, uh, we can just press it in place because the small offset uh, just causes the thing to friction fit. So I'm just going to go and push this in. So that required a bit of coercion to get in place, but now we've got a 0.1 inch header that we can attach connections to. So now we can attach the connections for ground, receive and transmit. There we are. Now, one of the problems we have with this uh, UART connection is that it isn't exactly free for use. Uh, the uh, UART is actually being used as the system console. Uh, so the chatter that the device makes as it's booting is going to be fed out over this uh, UART. So it isn't exactly free for us to attach a GPS to. Now, for anyone who hasn't seen a Linux machine booting and the sort of chatter you get through a serial port, I'll just demonstrate how this works by attaching it to my PC. Now, just in case there's anyone watching who's new to wiring up serial connections, I'll issue my standard warning, which is to say, be very careful of voltages. And uh, the reason for that is that RS-232, the kind of serial connection you find on the back of your computer or on these USB uh, serial dongles, uh, it uses uh, a very high signaling voltage, maybe plus, or mi plus and minus 12 volts or even more than that. And the reasons for this are historic. So uh, back in the old days, they needed to have a really high voltage because so much of the voltage uh, would be lost down a long um, telephone line or whatever they were sending the serial connection over. Uh, but these days, it's just done this way for historical reasons. But when you're actually connecting to many devices, in fact, most devices these days uh, use a more standard voltage of 0 and 3.3 volts or 0 and 1.8 volts. So you really don't want to be in a position where you uh, wire one of these things up directly to your device by mistake and put 12 volts or 30 volts up it or whatever and find you fried your device. That would be really, really unfortunate. So you need to take care to understand whether you're uh, using this true RS-232 vo uh, signaling voltage or whether you're using something a little bit more like logic levels, uh, whatever that may be on your device. And so uh, if you need to uh, connect at logic levels, you could use a level translator or you could just connect uh, one of these little devices. These are available from AliExpress for uh, 70 cents or so. And uh, this and uh, these two devices are basically the same, except that uh, this one here transmits at uh, three volts and uh, this one uses, I don't know, plus and minus 12 volts and generally you can tell which you're dealing with because anything with one of these db9 connectors on the side uh, usually will do the highest signaling voltage so just be careful about what you're wiring up here and uh, for my purposes with the pocket chip we're going to need this one okay so now we're all wired up so i've got receive connected to transmit and transmit connected to receive and the grounds attached together so now we're ready to see what this device is saying through its serial port OK, so now that USB serial device is connected to my PC, we want to start bringing in some of the signals that we're receiving. And uh, depending on your operating system, there will be various different ways to do it. On Linux, the uh, serial device will appear as a device node, as uh, dev tty uh, usb 0. 
and uh, on Ubuntu and Debian and Mint and those operating systems, uh, they're configured to put that device in the dial-out group. So you have to make sure that your user is in the dial-out group and uh, just look up online how to actually make that happen. You can see I've, I've already done that for my user account here. So with those permissions in place, I'm going to use GNU screen to capture the teletype that's coming in. So I'm going to use uh, the command screen slash dev tty usb zero. And then you want to specify the board rate. Now, uh, it varies what the board rate will actually be, uh, depending on what you're connecting to. Although if you're connecting to a Linux based board over a serial connection, uh, it's pretty likely to be a board rate of 115200. So let's begin listening for what it has to say. Okay, so now we're ready to see what signals this device sends while it boots. So I will reach in here and power it on. Now we're gonna get quite a lot of chatter coming through very quickly, uh, but then there are some lengthy delays in the booting. So I'll just cut to the end and then we'll go back and have a look through what we actually uh, got in the, uh, in the backlog. Okay, so the graphical login screen has appeared on the pocket chip and you can also see we've got a terminal login that's appeared on the serial console. Now before we go on and log in, let's have a look at what we've actually collected uh, from the boot process. So I will scroll back here. Uh, so the first message we get is uh, a bit of a hello from uBoot, the version number that's built and installed on this machine, uh, a bit of hardware information, the battery voltage, the uh, amount of RAM, uh, the CPU frequency, and the various uh, internal bus dividers, the various relative speeds of those buses to the CPU frequency. And then we get into uBoot proper, and we get a bit more hardware information, and then uh, we pause very briefly on this little line that says hit any key to stop auto boot. Now, uh, if you do hit a key within this uh, fractional period of time, uh, generally you get into it by mashing the keyboard. If you manage to hit a key in that time, then it will take you into a little mini shell inside U-Boot. And uh, inside that shell, you can uh, make various changes. You can reconfigure the boot process. You can reflash the device, that kind of thing. Now, this uh, little menu here presents a bit of a problem when I attach the GPS device, because uh, when you start the GPS device, when you power it on, it starts emitting a stream of characters continuously. And so it's very likely that you will end up getting kicked into the little shell inside this prompt here. So uh, this is a bit of a problem because this manifests as the device just appearing to get stuck while booting when the GPS is attached to it. Now I'm told there are various ways to make this uh, uh, make the U-Boot not be attached to this uh, serial console at all, uh, but I haven't actually gone into that yet. So for now, in order to make the device actually boot, I need to make sure that the GPS isn't attached to it while that happens, and we'll come to that in a minute. But if we don't enter the menu, then we enter the boot process proper, and uh, the first thing we get is a bit of... Uh, a dump of the partition information about the device and uh, the main partition is this UBI partition. Uh, the main file system is stored using UBFS which is a file system designed specifically for NAND flash. And then uh, the uh, U-boot goes ahead and uh, sets up the, uh, the, the kind of environment that the, the Linux kernel needs to start and uh, it loads up the device tree, which I talked about in a previous video, uh, loads up the initRD, which is the, uh, which contains the very early stage boot environment, the very first programs that are run inside the kernel. Then it loads Z image, which is the Linux kernel image, and then it starts up the kernel, and then the kernel starts itself, and uh, uh, loads the device tree, so it knows about the structure of the device, and then starts running the software in the initRD. Uh, and then, uh, we get a little bit more information about all that as it happens. Now, in a lot of devices, you'll then get a whole spew from the, the Linux kernel. Um, although, because uh, the serial port is so slow, uh, this can actually have a, an impact on how quickly the boot... Uh, the, how quickly Linux boots up. So I can see for that reason uh, the guys from the chip project have decided that they'll keep the Linux uh, spew silent. Uh, so all you see here is a, a pause uh, while the device boots itself and then the next thing that happens is you're presented by the login which is 
right here. Now the reason I wanted to show the output from the pocket chip here is because in many ways the output that you see here is quite similar to the sort of thing you're likely to see from any consumer device that you connect the serial port to. So for example if you've got a Linux embedded device like a router or a TV or, or a network attached storage or uh, even some kinds of uh, Android phones, things like that, if you can find a, a serial port and attach to it you can often get all kinds of useful information out of it and if you're lucky you might even get a login shell so if you're trying to gain control over the device and uh, make it do what you want your first port of call is often just to search the uh, search the main board of the device for something you can connect a serial port to so anyway now the device has started we can log in on the serial terminal so we can log in with the user and the password which is chip and there we are it is very very nice being able to control the device remotely because as I said it's pretty uncomfortable controlling it locally so being able to control it from the comfort of my PC is rather nice but of course the serial port is going away because I need it for the GPS so instead I'm going to install the SSH server and to install the SSH server I'm just going to do sudo apt install open SSH server and this will take a couple of minutes to complete I'll come back when it's finished Okay, so the SSH server is installed, which means that I can now log in remotely over Wi-Fi. And to do that, I'll just do SSH uh, chip at 192.168.0.29, which is, of course, the IP address of the pocket chip. And on first connection, you'll get this little warning, and you say yes, and the password is chip. Okay, so now I've got a remote login to the device, but from the comfort of the PC. Very handy. Okay, so I've split the display vertically using Tmux, and on the left I've got the login prompt uh, being displayed over the serial port, and on the right I've got a session uh, running in SSH, running over Wi-Fi. And uh, as I mentioned, I want to get rid of this, uh, uh, this login on the serial port so that we can free that serial port up to uh, connect the GPS to it. And uh, one of the uh, problems we've got is that um, at the moment, if we have a look at the uh, physical uh, TTY devices, the TTYS devices, uh, the TTYs 1, 2 and 3 um, are all in the dial-out group. But because the uh, TTY S0 is being used for a shell, uh, it is in the TTY group. Uh, and that's one of the problems. And the reason it's in the uh, TTY group is because uh, it has a program called Getty attached to it. And uh, Getty's job is basically to connect a, uh, a, a, a TTY device, a teletype device, and to connect that to a login and eventually uh, to an actual shell. Now, the reason Getty is running on this device is because System D has a program that has decided that it should be running the Getty on that device. So if we do systemctl uh, status serial Getty at tty.s0.service, now the main point is that normally in systemd a dot service is a physical file that exists on the disk and you can reconfigure it and you can override it and you can modify it. But in this case the uh, the getty uh, service has been created by this program called systemd getty generator. And in systemd generators are a bunch of programs which you can uh, set to automatically run um, before system D starts up and when they run they look at the system state and look at the configuration and uh, generate extra unit files in addition to the ones that are stored in files on disk and this is often done to make system D integrate with various legacy methods of configuration for example old-fashioned boot scripts but in this case the job of the system D Getty generator is that it looks at uh, the kernel configuration and it looks at the uh, serial terminal that is being used for the, the uh, boot spew and uh, it's, it, it concludes from the fact that the uh, zero, uh, serial port uh, TTYS0 it concludes from the fact that this is being used to show the boot up information that we must also want a shell on this so we need to disable the service created by this Getty generator so to do that, I'm going to do sudo systemctl mask 
serial getty at tty's zero dot service there and that will uh, it says that it's created a symlink here and that symlink is used to disable the service file that's going to be created uh, by that generator now all this is going to do is get rid of the uh, login prompt here we're still going to get the stuff coming out of uboot and we're still going to get the various messages that are emitted during boot up but still that's uh, that's enough uh, that's enough liberation for the serial port for us to be able to use it for the GPS. So I've rebooted the unit and I've got rid of that USB serial adapter and instead I've attached the GPS receiver. So now I've reconnected to the device over SSH. So let's have a look at the permissions on those physical serial ports again. So the command is ls-l slash dev slash tty s star. And now you can see all four of those uh, physical serial ports are in the dial-out group. TTYS0 is not in the TTY group because the Getty isn't attached to it anymore. And uh, I've already installed GNU screen on the, that, this device. And so we can actually see what the uh, GPS device is uh, emitting in the way of text. And uh, there's a standard for GPS devices. It's called NMEA, which is uh, the sort of uh, common standard that most, well, all GPS modules speak. And that, uh, that, that, um, that data is sent at 9600 board uh, by default. There we are. And uh, we're getting a whole bunch of information coming out of the device. Now, I can't read that directly, but um, uh, basically we're in a basement. So I'm not expecting to get any kind of fix uh, on the location of where we are. Uh, but this, da this text data that... Uh, this module is producing is enough for uh, any software to interpret it. Now, a lot of uh, GPS modules, including the U-Blocks, have various uh, other modes that you can put into it, put it into. And uh, in these proprietary modes, uh, they speak a more advanced sort of language where more information is given about uh, the GPS receiver's status. And it can also be set to give the information at a higher bandwidth, at higher speed. Uh, but by default, when you power a GPS module in, it will just start uh, spewing out all this location data. So now we've got this GPS signal coming in. I want to do something with it. And uh, there are a few different ways to do this. I'm quite a big fan of GPSD. So I will install GPSD now. GPSD the GPS daemon and also I want the GPSD clients um, and uh, as usual it will take a couple of seconds to install it um, but while it's installing let me explain what it does so GPSD is a little service that uh, uh, runs inside the device it connects to the uh, GPS receiver and then it runs a little network server and that network server can be used by various clients that can connect in and receive the uh, location data and uh, that location data it can be streamed around a network if you want it to be or it can just be uh, streamed into an application running on the local machine which is what I I'm doing right now and uh, the language that GPSD communicates is in JSON format so it's very easy for clients to talk to it. So now GPSD is installed we just have to configure the service so I'm going to go sudo nano I've got a better text editor installed at the moment nano will do and uh, on Debian family and on the pocket chip firmware this is the path to the configuration of GPSD. So in here we've got a few options and uh, the one we need is to insert um, the device path which is TTYS0. And now we need to restart the GP, uh, GPSD service. Right, now we can connect with a GPS monitor. Uh, connect a client and uh, see what happens. So I'm going to connect with GPS Mon, which is a command line client, and hopefully we should get some information coming out of GPSD. There we are. And uh, again, there isn't much in the way of uh, information coming back uh, because, of course, we're in a basement. We don't have line of sight, the sky, and so I'm not giving away the secret location of my uh, open tech lab here. But of course, this will all be populated with information when we get a fix on our location. 
Now, I will show off the GPSD clients in a bit more detail in a moment, and I'm going to head outside and test it. Uh, but uh, in addition to those uh, GPSD clients, which are all quite uh, quite simplistic applications, I want to have a nice a nice graphical um, a nice graphical view of the uh, of my location. So to do that, I'm going to install Marble, uh, which is uh, part of uh, the KDE software family. So if I install Marble, um, uh, we're going to have quite a lot of software to install. Install, as you can see, 250 packages, 343 megabytes of uh, space drawn in because we're <laughs> we're drawing in half of KDE here. Uh, but that's okay. I don't really care. Uh, so this is going to take a while and uh, we'll test it out on the pocket chip once it's installed. So I've come out here to the local park here and uh, as you can see it's a nice day, got a beautiful view of the lake and I've set up shop in a little gazebo here. Now the gazebo has a tin roof uh, which could be a problem for picking up GPS signals but by the looks of things the results I've got so far it doesn't look like we're doing too bad on that front. And if we take a closer look at the setup I've got here, you can see I've taped the GPS module to the side of the pocket chip and I've taped the antenna to the top and just tried to tape the bits of cabling down. Nothing too fancy. So let's have a look at the various GPST clients we've got here. So first up, I'm going to start up CGPS. So CGPS is a little terminal uh, application here and it lists uh, down the side all the uh, satellites that we're receiving from and also all the uh, coordinates that we've received. So this thing's quite good uh, just for that textual output running inside a terminal. And then if for something a bit more graphical as a status display there is XGPS. Now XGPS I believe is GTK powered and uh, it shows the same thing but uh, in a graphical view. The only problem that uh, we're having on this small screen is that the uh, little uh, graphics box here doesn't properly display uh, here and of course this could easily be fixed. It could easily be uh, made so that uh, this window becomes responsive and can shrink down to this smaller size and fit the circle within it. So maybe if someone wants to patch that, you know, be my guest, go ahead and uh, you'll uh, greatly improve the functioning of XGPS on these tiny screen devices. Next up there's also XGPS Speed which is a little speedo view. Now, of course, I'm not actually moving anywhere, I'm sitting still, but you can imagine this is quite useful if you're uh, on some form of transportation in a car or whatever, you can see how fast you're going. Okay, so I've come back to the pocket window manager here because I need the maximum amount of screen space for this one, and I'm gonna start up Marble. Now, Marble is KDE's globe viewer application. It shows a map of the world, and uh, for some reason, it's not rep uh, it's not rendered using OpenGL hardware acceleration. It's just rendered using software acceleration, which is a bit of a weird quirk. It wouldn't really make a difference because it's going to be software rendered uh, regardless. But uh, it's just an interesting decision that they made in the design of it. Now, uh, as it starts up, it's going to emit a whole bunch of these uh, messages. Uh, a lot of GUI applications seem to do this. I never quite understand why they're so chatty. And uh, I can dismiss this little K wallet pop up here. Um, and it takes a second or two to start. Have to be patient. There we are, and we have a map of the world. Now, this isn't the first time I've run Marble, and uh, on the first install, you get a whole load of sidebars and things down the left, and on this tiny screen, they really do sort of just eat up all the space, and uh, you get a toolbar on the top, so the map that you get gets spudged into this tiny area in the corner here. And uh, it's also very, very hard to use the uh, use the touch screen uh, with 
um, uh, with this application, uh, partly because of the alignment and partly just because of the very small size of everything you have to click on. But I want to bring up the location sidebar and I want to set the uh, position tracking input to GPS D. And uh, it's going to take a second or two to get that location information from the GPS. And there we have it. We've got the uh, input coming in. And now if I click on that, uh, there, oh, yes, it's already uh, centered us. Now, because I was finding the uh, touch screen so hard to use, I've just got and attached a mouse to this thing, which really does make things a lot, lot better. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. And uh, you can see our location here in northern Colorado uh, let's get closer in and you can see we're in Fort Collins now uh, now the imagery the by default of the, the Atlas uh, it isn't that there isn't that much detail so let me just uh, change the map view we have on here and we'll turn on the open street map and uh, by the way open street map is a really cool project that I love contributing to it's basically the Wikipedia for maps and I'm just going to turn off this uh, info box, the um, uh, the overview. There we go. Got a bit more screen area now, and uh, we can now zoom in on our location on uh, here in the park. And if we get in really close, uh, you should be able. So you might be able to see the little blue icon for the gazebo that we're sitting in uh, popping out here. So that's really good. I think from using this, it just goes to show that um, uh, the standard uh, Linux desktop applications are really, really hard to use with the tiny screen and the touch screen um, alignment issues. And uh, ideally, if you do write, if you do use graphical applications, they really need to be something that's uh, designed to cater for this. So something with nice big hit boxes that you can click on and that sort of thing. Uh, but even so, I think this is a reasonably good demo of uh, the sorts of things that it might be possible to do with this. Uh, taking uh, some kind of um, sensors out into the field and displaying the data and uh, overall although it was a little bit tricky to get it set up and working uh, I think this is quite a good demo of the sorts of things I'll be able to do with this thing. Right, so it feels good to be back in the lab space. Uh, the rule of the live demo is such a killer especially when you're out in the field having to solve problems. Anyway, just before we finish up let's have a look at the purchasing information about the uh, pocket chip and chip kits. So if we go to the chip website and head to the store page, uh, there is this little banner along the top saying due to outrageous holiday demand, chip and pocket chip are currently out of stock and available on back order. Both items are estimated to be back in stock in Q1 2017. Well, we're in quarter one 2017 and this banner is still there. So I think they're having a bit of uh, supply and demand issues. Uh, this product's obviously going down very nicely, very popular. But uh, if you want to order one now, you might have to wait a while for it to come back in stock. Uh, but uh, if you're interested in ordering one, it's well worth placing an order. The price is really good. Pocket, the pocket chip kit is $69. Uh, the uh, chip by itself, if you want it to just do it that way, is $9. Uh, and the HDMI adapter is uh, $15. And also you can spend $2 for the chip case if you're just buying the chip by itself. But of course, all of that is included in the uh, uh, pocket chip kit. This includes uh, the pocket chip itself, the chip inside and the shell on the back. Well, I hope you found that interesting. If you did, give it a big thumbs up and subscribe. And uh, I also recommend checking out the show notes, which are linked down below somewhere here. And uh, the reason is that uh, I link all the various bits of source information and uh, the various things that are in this video, uh, any code, anything like that, all goes in the show notes. And uh, in the previous video about the HDMI capture device, after I published the video, a whole load of new information came to light. People started uh, working on the device and uh, I found out a few new things. So check it out if you're interested in any updates and that kind of thing. But otherwise, that's about all for today. So thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you next time on the Open Tech Lab.